functionality. You might be a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of what will happen in other cities, but Toronto is very advanced as well. But we have driverless cars, you know, driving around now in Silicon Valley. Um, I live right up the street from Google. Uh, and uh, at Google, you know, they used to collect the, um, they were very uh, competitive in hiring and looked at your test scores and looked at your transcripts and all kinds of information. They put it into a giant database and analyzed how did that predict your success at Google. And they found out that the traditional measures of school didn't predict success at all uh, in this new world. They found that what they really needed was to evaluate um, candidates' learning ability, their ability to learn on the job, uh, because there's so much new knowledge, your ability to find information, find it, make sense of it, weigh and balance, invent things with others, test it out, uh, refine it, improve it without somebody else telling you how you need to improve, but actually being self-reflective and metacognitive and so on. And so now, I don't know if you've seen this silly movie called The Internship with uh, Vince Van and Vaughn and uh, Owen Wilson. Yeah, they do these tasks and so on. It's not unlike that. They actually are looking to figure out people's learning ability, their ability to collaborate, to get along, and to invent and to do solve problems. So that's really what schools are being asked to do in a you know in a new society. Our kids are going to have to work with knowledge that hasn't been discovered yet, using technologies that haven't been invented yet, uh, solving big problems that we haven't solved. And they're gonna need to do that in ways that are uh, collaborative and self-managing. So much of school is a trans has still, you know, we're still trying to get out of that old transmission curriculum from, you know, it sort of evolved from the days when there weren't a lot of books that people had to memorize a lot of things. Uh, so we, you know, we're trying to move beyond the memorization and the transmission curriculum. Now, of course, one of my colleagues, Sam Weinberg, has a new book out, Why Should You Learn History If You Could Google It On Your Phone, right? So, <laughs> you know, this, this notion that you know, we need people to understand the structure of knowledge. We need them to understand facts are still important, but they have to sit in an understanding of a, of a context, and you cannot you know, learn all the facts you need. You have to learn how to learn, right? So I know that's going on in Ontario, and I know that that's part of your your work. Um, but what, what that means for training teachers is something that we're all figuring out, that, that teachers need to uh, learn how to help kids be learners, uh, be effective learners, be metacognitive learners, um, be confident learners. Um, be recursive and iterative learners rather than just how to you know take information and remember it and spit it back the other thing that i think is really interesting and important for teacher education is the rapid progress of neuroscience uh and what and the other sciences of learning and development cognitive science learning science uh, developmental science and i've been doing some work with colleagues here in the united states on sort of the implications of the science of learning and development for teaching and then the implications for teacher education. And uh, among the things we're seeing is that, um, first of all, neural pathways and neural development, uh, which are of course happening very rapidly in, in infants, um, but they're also happening very rapid. There's another big, big push in adolescence uh, and it's a combination of how pathways grow and connect and then how we prune them and reconnect. But the brain is actually enhanced. The architecture of the brain is enhanced by a number of things. Key among them is relationships. Uh, in fact, the, just the relationship between the you know, attachment that you've you know, heard about, but it's, it's not just that um, kids are more secure when they are attached to caring adults, but their brain develops more productively when those adults are responsive, when there is an iterative conversation going on. It turns out that vocabulary development is not about the amount of words you hear, it's about the number of conversation every time uh, a mom or a dad you know, goes goo goo gaga back to the baby when they say that and they have this whole thing going on. That is actually building a neural, our architecture of the brain. 
the relationship, the hugging, actually produces hormonal responses, which produce neural responses in the brain. Um, so strong, positive, affirming, responsive relationships and language turn out to be extremely important in neural development. And the implications for classrooms are, of course, that we need classrooms where, of course, there's a lot of uh, interactive conversation because we actually do not only learn by talking, but we build brain architecture by engaging in language, two-way engagement in language. We know that uh, the brain and neural pathway development is enhanced by green space, by being outdoors, by um, uh, uh, languages, by symbol systems, by music and art and uh, learning of languages. They've done autopsies on the brains of people who had Alzheimer's disease and those who were multilingual um, were showed the symptoms of the disease five years later than those who were monolingual because they had so much more brain capacity developed that they were able to, um, you know, sustain themselves, themselves longer. Um, physical activity stimulates neural pathways in the brain. Uh, and we think better when we're active. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of work on uh, you know, physical fitness, you actually have, there's a new study that you actually have better thoughts when you're walking <laughs> or after you, right after you're really active. Um, and for kids who often, you know, get labeled as uh, ADHD or whatever, who need to be active, they are learning better. There's a lot of research. They're learning that all of us uh, need activity uh, to be uh, learning optimally. So, you know, I think about places like Finland, where uh, the kids go outdoors every hour for 15 minutes. Even the little ones, they put their little snowshoes and snow boots on and run out around 15 minutes every hour. They have music every day, uh, art. Uh, as in some parts of um, Ontario, there's multiple languages being learned. When I was, when I was there, uh, most of the kids were learning three languages, and they all had different al alphabet systems, um, English, Russian, Arabic. Uh, is one of the most um, uh, rapidly increasing languages there. Uh, but the, all of that is neural development. And so if you think about designing school around what we know about um, you know, the development of, of the brain, it would be a place that is, uh, first of all, very relational. We would design schools so there are strong long-term relationships between adults and kids. Um, you know, with looping of teachers for multiple years, with uh, advisors or others in high school staying with kids for multiple years, well known with many opportunities for the building of strong relationships. They would be places that have a lot of physical activity that have, of course, uh, things like nutrition and all that matter uh, as well, uh, and would have a lot of art, a lot of music, a lot of language, um, and somewhere you'd fit in, you know, reading and math. <laughs> but also it would be learned more easily if we were taking care of the whole child through the whole grade. Uh, the other thing we're learning from the science of learning and development is that um, emotions and learning are tightly linked. So we actually learn more effectively when we're in a positive emotional state. We like the teacher, if we feel safe in the classroom, if we're uh, if we, you know, are engaged in something that is um, joyful, uh, interesting, um, not feeling stigmatized, not feeling social identity threat, not worrying about whether I'm going to be bullied or marginalized. If you're in a positive state, you learn more effectively. Uh, when you're in a negative, when you have negative emotional activity going on, you learn much less effectively. So punitive approaches are, are counterproductive. Uh, when kids have experienced trauma, or adverse experiences and conditions outside of school or even inside of school, uh, then, then their ability to learn is, is less. Um, and so you know, creating that a positive social space. Now, of course, people live in, in the real world. It isn't all positive. It's not Disney World. Um, so you have to think about how to help kids cope with the experiences that they have, as well as trying to create a setting in which there's as much psychological safety and physical safety as possible. 
Um, so teaching explicitly teaching social and emotional skills uh, of how to recognize one's emotions, how to manage those emotions. Uh, I don't know if this is true in Canada. I'd be interested to learn in the U.S. Mindfulness is becoming very widespread in schools um, as a as a coping mechanism, as a centering mechanism, but also uh, strategies to help kids uh, learn conflict resolution tools, to learn how to talk with one another productively, how to manage difficult situations. Um, you know, all of these kinds of social and emotional skills and tools, how to be persevering, how to be resilient, how to develop a growth mindset. All of these things have huge implications for learning, for student achievement in school, uh, for graduation and for life. And so this notion that we need to find ways in school to explicitly teach social and emotional skills um, and to continue to teach and refine those skills is very important. One of the things about a growth mindset that is extremely important is that kids have got to have the opportunity to see that if they um, get feedback in a productive way, use that feedback to improve their work, uh, that they can become more competent. Uh, and what that suggests is an approach to curriculum with much more opportunity to revise work, uh, to continue to improve it to meet the standards so that you can both become more competent, but you can also become more confident. You can see that those efforts, you know, make a difference. To redo uh, tests, to, you know, uh, to in various ways have that experience of feedback and improvement, feedback and improvement, feedback and improvement. Uh, and that is a different pedagogy than you know, teach a chapter, give a test, give a grade, teach a chapter, give a test, give a grade. A lot of people have um, experience in which some schools have actually forced teachers to do because they'll get sort of a pacing schedule and so say you got to teach this in this, in this order. Um, so that's all of those pieces are very important uh, for the learning process and for the redesign uh, of schools as well. And then, of course, in the pedagogies themselves, um, in, in uh, content classrooms and so on, uh, we need to be thinking about how to uh, teach kids cognitive strategies as well as teaching them that. A lot of learning science uh, literature which shows that um, teaching kids how to think about something, how to approach the writing of an essay or how to approach the learning of a particular thing, teaching them uh, helping them recognize how they learn best and to be metacognitive about their own learning strategy uh, so that they can deploy those strategies and then they can learn others. Um, it actually makes a huge difference in learning. And there have been some really interesting studies in um, uh, reading and writing where uh, students have been taught cognitive strategies for how to approach the work. And in the groups of kids who got that cognitive uh, training, special education students uh, outperformed the regular education students in the control group because they were more effective in using strategies. So they weren't just told, do it, you know, do this thing. They were told, here are ways to think about how you do that well. And so that's another piece of the kind of learning science that is helping us think about uh, teaching in some, in some new ways. So, and then the final thing I would say is that it's very important um, because we have uh, in our modern world a lot of um, adverse conditions for children and families in many contexts uh, that teachers be able to be alert to those needs uh, and that they're, they're able to engage in sort of um, multi different kinds of responses to the students' needs and that schools are designed to have multi systems of support without a lot of barriers between identifying what's needed and getting what's needed uh, without a lot of bureaucracy in the way. So um, one of the things this implies for universities is, you know, in the olden days, the universities were designed so that psychology was over here and teaching was over here, which meant learning was here and teaching was there and they weren't very tightly connected. So, you know, bringing together learning and teaching is really important. 
uh, so that teachers are learning deeply about learning so that they can be flexible and uh, inventive in creating means to support learning. Uh, it's good to have some teaching tools and techniques and strategies that are tested. We all need those. And we need to deeply understand learning, both learning differences uh, and learning uh, commonalities. So that's um, you know, a piece of the, the puzzle. I think uh, teachers' deep knowledge base about learning is what will allow them to continue to evolve their practice. Uh, and to evolve the practices of school so that they become closer and closer uh, to what is needed in um, in this modern world. Uh, the other thing that we struggle with, I know this is just a less of a struggle in Canada, but still, you know, it's on the table. I hear people talk about it. Uh, you know, we have uh, evolved over recent years a sort of a testing um, and textbook strategy for accountability that. Um, you know, mostly uh, emphasizes um, multiple choice, uh, you know, tests, uh, maybe with a few short written answers. There are, of course, some traditions in in, um, in Canada of the of the older blue book strategy of the British diaspora of, you know, sort of uh, writing the exams, you know, that are more thoughtful. But we've also been um, affected by the U.S. Um, uh, desire to do everything cheaply and easily, and uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I, you know, I wish I could <laughs> carry that with me. Um, but you know, this whole idea that somehow you can measure learning by having kids find one answer out of five is a bankrupt idea, and it really pushes teaching in the wrong direction. And that's going to be a challenge for teachers. Uh, there is no activity in life where you have to solve a problem by finding one answer out of five that are provided for you. This doesn't happen. Uh, and if we spend a lot of time getting kids ready to do that and thinking in that way, it's a particular form of cognition. It is not the form of cognition that, um, that they have to use uh, at Google or any place else where they are you know, doing the kind of work that's needed in the 21st century. So I just put that out as a challenge. It's not something that, um, you know, there's an easy answer for, but it is something that uh, over time, I hope that teachers and school leaders will be empowered enough to reinvent these systems that um, affect the way that schools operate, that, you know, really shape the way that teaching unfolds. So uh, that's sort of the what of teacher ed that is kind of new and that people are struggling with around the world. Um, and the how of teacher education, I'll take a minute on, and then I want us to have time for some conversation. <clears throat> so what I think is interesting, I'm going to go back to the redesign of medicine in the early 1900s. So you probably know that in um, 1910, you could go into medicine uh, by, you know, following another doctor around in a buggy and selling tonics that would cure cancer and baldness at the same time. You could become a doctor by memorizing, taking a three-week course of study and memorizing a list of symptoms and a list of cures. But you could also become a doctor by going to Johns Hopkins University, where they had organized the sciences of learning, created a teaching hospital where you could begin to apply what you know, uh, connected those two things, and created a very different model. And it was the Flexner Report in the U.S. that Carnegie um, funded. Abraham Flexner was a secondary school teacher, actually, but he did the study of all the medical schools and basically said, you know, this is a pretty messed up field, but there is this model and we should try to pursue that. Um, his brother or cousin or somebody was the head of the accrediting body. They then said to be accredited, you have to have a teaching hospital, you have to organize the sciences of medicine, et cetera, et cetera. So in every country of the world now, all over the world in every um, part of the globe. To become a doctor, you have to go through a kind of training in which you have that experience in a teaching hospital. And um, that merger, and it's not perfect, uh, we all know that, but that merger of theory and practice, of uh, the clinical work, oh my, uh, they're trying to uh, install something on my machine. <laughs> The, the clinical work and the, um, the theoretical work uh, was a breakthrough for the profession of medicine. 
And we're kind of poised in teacher education for that breakthrough. And I'm seeing this happen around the globe. Many, many places are creating strong relationships with whether they call them model schools or training schools or teaching schools or professional development schools uh, with schools that uh, are organized for the preparation of teachers clinically and are connected to the curriculum uh, in the university so that what you're learning you can see instantiated uh, in the clinical experience. Uh, they're organizing to provide a full year of clinical experience uh, under the wing of a strong a team or uh, mentor and to allow that transmission of knowledge and skill to be much more uh, certain, much more coherent, much more aligned, et cetera. And I know that's something that's been going on um, in many parts of Canada and Ontario among them. It's something I now see in you know, Australia and Shanghai and Singapore and you know, places in the U.S., Governments that are making the most strides on this, of course, are funding it. You know, they're making it possible for people to create these very uh, um, integrated approaches. Uh, not every place that has that happening. Uh, and as you know, because you're, I'm sure, involved in various aspects of this clinical theory to practice challenge, um, it's very important to have a stable base of of resources and, and relationships. These relationships have to be built over time. Uh, it's important for the university to actually be able to take, uh, to contribute to um, and take some responsibility for building the quality of practice in the school site, as well as for practitioners in the school sites to be engaged in informing uh, and helping to shape the way the curriculum is unfolding at the university. Uh, and of course, one of the hardest things for universities is for the faculty to get together and build a coherent, tightly integrated course of study, uh, rather than people each teaching their own thing. I teach my course and it's what I do. And, you know, we have to come together and really make it seamless, reinforcing, um, and, and then connected to practice. So I think that is the fundamental uh, challenge. And I think the the field is making some progress on this challenge uh, of teacher education because it's hard to, the, the practice of teaching where you're trying to understand how to teach, not just your content area, but also the kids with all of their needs uh, and to take into account uh, the kinds of things we're learning about learning to create these classrooms, which are lots of um, collaboration and guided uh discussion, which is not just random discussion and, you know, all the things that are implied by what we were talking about earlier, um, is challenging. And you can't do it if you have to, if you can't do it easily, if you have to just imagine what it might look like. You know, ideally you need to be in a setting where you're seeing it happen, where you're learning, um, you know, under the wing of, of a mentor teacher, where your experience is highly coherent and aligned. So I think that's, uh, you know, there's a recognition of that. There's a lot of great work going on in that regard all over the world. And there is a, an understanding, I think, that that's where we need to get. Um, part of my work now is on policy, and I'm trying to help governments understand what they can do to enable educators to do their jobs well. Uh, because uh, right now we are always, you know, having to put, you know, patch things together, uh, usually without that. Uh, support for the system as it needs to become. Uh, and so I'm, I'd love to hear how you're working on all of these um, challenges and problems and um, talk about whatever interests you uh, in the work that you're doing. Thank you. That's awesome, Linda. And do now is I'd really love to open up the discussion and have people ask questions, make statements that are around these challenges that Linda has so uh, brilliantly identified. I saw everybody shaking their head and saying, yes, I actually was making notes on my little iPhone here because I left my notepad over there. So, <laughs> uh, but so far, I think we, we are very much aligned to a lot of the uh, people that you presented. 
So um, I just want to remind people that the microphone that helps Linda here is over here. You probably don't have to come right to the microphone, but you will have to speak up. Linda, you will let us know if you can't hear. And yep. I'm going to be monitoring the camera, and I'll try and get you to be able to see what the person looks like. Okay. To the question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, over to you folks. I know I have lots of things I could say about some of what Linda said, but I'm... Go ahead. Aiden. Hi, Aiden Turner. Um, I'm just wondering about your stance on standardized testing. Um, here in the province of Ontario, we are a publicly funded education system and our government tends to place a lot of validity on this massive EQAO test that they put out every year uh, to our grade 3, our grade 6, our grade 9, and I believe our grade 10 students as well. Just wondering your stance on the validity of uh, standardized testing. Uh, in, in many societies, there's a strong need, felt need, to you know, monitor the outcomes of schooling along the way. Uh, and I am not opposed to assessments. I think assessments can be useful. Uh, they can provide information, particularly in societies struggling with inequalities of various kinds. You know, making sure that you can attend to inequalities is important. But I think the nature of the testing also matters a great deal. And um, I think that uh, some societies have moved towards uh, approaches to assessment that are much more thoughtful. Uh, what kids ask you, how they're asked to show their knowledge and, and um, skill is much more ambitious, intellectually ambitious and um, close to what you would need to do in the real world than what most standardized testing is in North America. Uh, and so most standardized testing in North America is, you know, as I said, multiple choice or short answer types of tests, uh, which I think are uh, not a good form of accountability because they're not good representation of what you have to do in the real world with your, with your knowledge. Um, so I think we need to move forward. I've spent a lot of time in Singapore, uh, where the whole education system is populated by everyone who moves into different roles in the system from teaching. So the examinations board is populated by former teachers and the ministry is populated by former teachers. And they have designed an examination system which is mostly, uh, almost entirely open-ended. It is um, uh, everything from oral examinations in language to uh, essays and problem solutions and so on. But they also now have performance tasks, <clears throat> which uh, many um, states in the U.S. are trying to put back, uh, where in the sciences, you know, the kids will design a science inquiry and they'll conduct that inquiry and they'll... Uh, write up the results, and the teachers will score that, and they figure out how to score those reliably. Um, and that's part of the assessment system. Same thing happens in many Australian states uh, in the high school. They'll do a design experiment in the 10th grade where the kids collaborate to design on invention to solve a problem. They keep uh, collaboration journals, they keep research journals as they go, they have to uh, design this thing, test it out, improve it, present it to the class, et cetera. There's a whole format for how to do it. It can all be scored, and the teachers score that as part of the assessment system. So number one, I think the assessments need to be representative of what you do in the real world. Uh, it takes more time to do that. It takes a lot of engagement in how you train teachers to score those things. But at the end of the day, it's better learning. So I think we need strong learning to be represented in assessments. Number two, I think assessments should always to improve opportunity to learn, never to keep kids out of an opportunity to learn, to improve educators' knowledge about how kids are performing and learning and to help them, you know, uh, strengthen the curriculum and strengthen the supports for students and not as punishments. So the nature of the assessments should be authentic to learning and the use of the assessments should always be for improvement. You have places like Finland where there are no external assessments at all, and they continue to be near the top of the international rankings uh, in you know, uh, performance. When teachers design assessments inside the classroom uh, based on the national curriculum 
it's sort of the syllabus and what it, it, it suggests. Um, and, you know, I think that's working for them. I don't know that that is politically viable in countries like um, the U.S. or Canada, uh, but I think we could do a lot more to make our assessments productive. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the OTF president, Diane Dewing, has a question for you. I will try and get her on camera for you, but um, Diane, the camera is behind you. So let's, uh, let's see what we can do here. Uh, hello, Linda. So I, I'm so glad to hear your words about the teaching experience and, and, and supports and resources. But one of the things that we're struggling with right now is in order to create that excellent teacher response that to learning needs that's timely, appropriate, flexible, and inventive. We're, we're struggling with increasingly large class sizes and the lack of both person and, and material resources to service the needs of our students. Yeah. And, and, you know, older teachers like me have developed a a backpack, if you will, of strategies that are sometimes successful, but our new teachers go home with guilt every night and it's difficult to keep people in a profession when they have such a belief in what good education looks like, in fact, excellent education, but not the resources and needs yeah. very, very many bodies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean and the more, the, the more we teach teachers what's needed and how to do it, the more weight they carry. Uh, I, you know, I've been teaching for 40 years and I still carry that, you know, every day, every time I teach a lesson, it's like, oh, you know, what about this? What about that? What about the student? One of the things we actually have to help teachers do is develop a psychological framework which they can forgive themselves, so to speak, or can understand that you cannot meet every need. Um, without saying you can't meet any needs, you know, yeah, I mean, you have to, there's a way you have to kind of help yourself not become inured to students. A lot of teachers have dealt with the factory model overload of students and needs by just becoming inured, but you need to be able to be responsive and get uh, understanding that it's, it's not something that you can you know, meet every need every day. And and you don't want people leaving the profession for that. Of course, we need a policy conversation, but how do you get the right kind of class sizes and the right kinds of you know materials and, and, and um, investments, uh, particularly in the schools that serve kids with higher needs? So, I mean, yeah, that's obviously part of the long-term uh, solution. Our societies put so much on schools um, you know, and often then, you know, don't uh, support them in, in meeting all those needs. The other thing I would just say is that um, there are structural strategies that do help um, some of this. And I don't know the extent to which this is happening in uh, Ontario or other uh, high schools, but uh, we've been working with school redesigns where every teacher has a small advisory of 15 kids and they meet that advisory uh, almost every day, usually every day or three or four times a week for an hour. That's where they do social emotional learning and academic supports and they you know, connect with the parents and the advisor stays with the kids for two or three or four years to high school. And they have that very strong uh, personal relationship. Every kid has an advisor, every advisor has a small group of kids counts as a part of your course load. It's not an add-on. It's right, you know, right there. Um, it's kind of distributed counseling. The counselors also have to learn what to do and so on. But it allows you to care more effectively for the kids that you have. Uh, and it allows kids to be cared for more effectively and families to be integrated. And with the needs that families have these days and the needs that kids have, the fact that we want to graduate everybody, we don't want to be like Back in the olden days when only half the kids graduated, so it felt easier to have talents just weren't there. Um, but sometimes school redesigns are going to be important to allow teachers to care effectively because I was a high school teacher. You know, I cared about my kids, but I had 180 kids. I couldn't care for the kid. There was no structure to help me uh, care effectively and to help my teammates care effectively 
And that means more time for teachers not in the factory line assembly line. Like Canada and the US have done a lot of things similarly. One of the things that we have both done is fill up teachers' days with teaching responsibilities to a very great extent. And so the US is worse than Canada on this, but you guys are in much worse shape typically than Shanghai or Singapore or many other countries where teachers have, you know, 15, 20 hours a week when they're not with kids that they can call a parent, grab a child, meet with colleagues, plan collaboratively. And that's a school design question. And as a profession, we've got to get knowledgeable about how to redesign schools so that they can meet the needs of the kids and the teachers who are in them today. Um, so I think that's another part of the long-term um, solutions. Great. Other questions? Go ahead. Hi there, Linda. My name's uh, my name's Jeff, and I'm a recent graduate from the program. So I'm just making my way out into the supply teaching world, and hopefully soon the permit teaching world. My question is about predicting the future, I guess, in a certain way. Um, you talked about I really like how you said that multiple choice testing doesn't really mimic anything that people have to do in the real world anymore. And you did talk about some of the things that people do have to do. They have to interact. They have to collaborate. They have to have empathy, etc. In, in my teacher education program, I think a lot of us here too see the statistics like, you know, in 30 years there will be 8 million coding jobs unfilled or whatever these statistics are. They're kind of predicting the future in a way and trying to give us a roadmap of where our future students will be going with their lives. What are some of the ways that you try to, and I, and I don't know that those are always correct, so what are some of the ways that you try to, in a way, predict the future to make sure we're teaching the students the things that they are going to need when they hit the workforce 20 years from now, for example? Yeah. Well, you know, um, none of us can predict the future uh, perfectly. And if we don't get climate, you know, under control, we might not have a world 20 years from now. So, you know, it's, it's a very unpredictable time. Um, human beings will need flexibility, creativity, inventiveness, the capacity to figure out from their environment what's going on and make judgments about what to do. So irrespective of whose predictions are right and, and whose are wrong, and maybe everyone's will be wrong, those capacities on the part of kids are really, really important. Um, that they develop the capacity to problem solve, to think critically, to look at what's going on, to be you know, um, uh, open-minded and so on. So the, I think as teachers, the best thing we can do is try to develop those capacities in our kids. Um, you know, is really to give them opportunities. There's a lot of places in the U.S. Sometimes I use a little video clip, but you can see this if you go on the um, website of the National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development. <laughs> Commission, S-E-A-D. There's a bunch of little videos. Uh, many schools are developing what they call maker spaces, and this may be happening in Canada as well, where kids are given the opportunity to, with lots of materials and tools and to make things and refine them and take them apart and put them back together, and et cetera. There's a wonderful little um, video clip of a maker space in a kindergarten in, in a Washington, D.C. public school. And you can see how kids are developing these capacities that I just mentioned uh, by the way they're engaging with this environment. Um, and people are trying to figure out how to carry this notion forward into high school. Even the example I gave you from Singapore of the design, um, the design experiment thing that the kids have to do uh, in tenth grade as a collaboration to invent something and problem solve and so on develops these skills of okay, we've got a problem. What are we going to do about it? Not feeling helpless not feeling like somebody else is going to give me the answer, not feeling like somebody's got five answers and I'm going to choose one, but I've got to come up with a way to solve a problem and then giving them lots of opportunities. Of course, inquiry-oriented teaching uh, where they you know, get to inquire into problems, it doesn't mean there isn't some direct instruction. There is ideally both direct instruction and inquiry-based uh, learning, but that, that develops those skills. Uh, the more kids can have rubrics that say, here's uh, how to improve and, and so on, and then use them themselves so get to self-assessing their work and their, their solutions, the more prepared they will be to be independent 
uh, flexible learners and doers in the world. Terrific. Um, I hope nobody minds I'm going to take a question for myself. <laughs> I'm the holder of the camera at this time. I don't know if I can get it back to myself, Linda, but you know what I look like, right? Um, okay, there you go. I'm somewhere there. Um, Linda, uh, you know, sometimes Anne Lieberman talks about um, having ideas that are radical ideas, radical ideas. And it seems to me, especially in where you were talking about, actually a lot of the things that you've spoken about, I've seen teachers in our school system doing. Mm -hmm. I've been into schools where I see teachers doing phenomenal things that are pretty radical in terms of working against some of the um, assumed things that teachers would be doing in their classrooms and things that really make a difference in students' lives. But an idea that seems radical to me, which should not be radical, is the notion of the purpose of assessment. And you mentioned earlier this notion of allowing assessments that then build mastery. So mastery learning is a, as a concept that we had long ago and that for a while in, I guess, the 70s or the 80s was something that we were pursuing. These days, assessment is always used to see, um, even in, the, in its best ways, you know, so we're looking at what the students have learned and on we go to the next unit, as opposed to saying this is what the students have learned and now let's allow for retesting and no punitive measures for retesting. In other words, if you got 60 the first time you did it, do it again or learn, you know, let's remediate, do it again, and now you've got 80. And 80 should be your grade, right? Yes. Um, like that as teachers because we're so used to, um, you know, not allowing that. But I, I think that when we even see teachers trying to do that, and I, I have to give faculties of education a lot of uh, credit for moving in that direction, right? It's all about supporting and growing the skills. But then what happens for our students, even if they've had the best possible experience of assessment in their schools, in their elementary and in their high schools, then they go to university, right? And my real question to you is, how do we take this notion of what education really should look like and how we we move students to mastery. How do we, who understand pedagogy in faculties of education and within our schools, how do we push that radical idea forward so that universities and colleges also start to look at how it is they're actually instructing students and then how it is they're assessing our students? Sorry, it was a long question, but you understand what I'm trying yeah, to say? Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, <laughs> you know, there's a saying that I've heard in the US that. Um, uh, teacher, uh, teacher educators or education school faculty, you know, uh, try to change elementary and secondary schools because they can't do anything about their own. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, I mean, it's hard to change universities, but there are places that have created, uh, think of Montclair State University, uh, it's, which is in New Jersey. They've created a center for pedagogy, which is for the whole university. School of Education is very well respected there. They really are looked at as experts about learning and they are engaged in working with um, faculty. Um, and there's some other universities around the, the globe that do this where uh, faculty have the opportunity to learn, where there are lots of lectures on the, on the campus about learning and how to promote learning and what kind of pedagogies are, are needed. There are strategies for Usually younger professors, those who are coming into the profession, uh, even teaching assistants and, and others to get training in um, how people learn and how to teach well. It's a little harder to get the older professors to come out for things like that. But um, there are uh, universities where a culture of bringing um, knowledge about learning into the pedagogy of higher education uh, is being pursued. You got to get somebody in the president or the provost's office excited about this. Sometimes having that um, physical, um, you know, place, a center of pedagogy or a center of teaching and learning for the, the campus can be very helpful. And then beginning to create these kinds of programs of study, programs of discourse and dialogue um, can make a difference. Thank you. That's excellent. Okay. Uh, Steve, and Hi. I will try and turn to you. Go uh, ahead. Okay, don't you. Uh, implementation of some of these within a classroom, concepts in a classroom, tends to be more, I 
Brazil a lot more difficult. Like one of the concepts you were bringing up was the the feedback and improvement, where you're retesting, you re-go back to it, they think, do well, so we go back and relook at it. I'm from a science teacher high school. I have like two hours to teach a certain item. And when I get it, when I get evaluated, the administration wants to know where I am in that curriculum outlay because I should be here by now, but you're still here. And it's like, well, because that's where the students are at. So I, as a teacher, my evaluation drops because my students are doing better, but they're not going as far in the curriculum. And it's sort of a catch 22 where you've got theory saying this is great to do, but if you implement it, you could be doing it at your job safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is where, you know, the nature of teaching is so affected by the ideas that administrators have about how, uh, and it may be also driven by testing. You know, if you're, I don't know if you're having to be responsive to a, an external test uh, that you got to cover everything. In the U.S., we've had, we've struggled a lot with the standards based reforms that we've had since the you know 1990s um, and the notion that many schools have adopted that you got to get through either you got to get through all the chapters of the book or you got to get through all the standards and uh, and it's a coverage curriculum rather than a depth of knowledge uh, strategy and so there's there's had to be a lot of conversations for the school as a whole, for administrators. This is where you know what you do in training leaders matters as much as what you do in training teachers, because if the leaders don't get it, then the teachers are hemmed in from doing this kind of deeper learning. Um, but uh, what some schools have done is they've tried to identify uh, in the curriculum power either power standards or. Uh, units uh, or or projects where they can go deep. They may not be able to go deep on everything uh, to allow kids to learn the, the process and the methods and so on. You know, if you could take time with your kids to learn how to actually design and conduct, you know, a scientific experiment and really do the whole thing and revise it, that they learn a set of skills that they that transfer yeah. to other settings, right? And so they're going to carry that deep knowledge with them into other things. And you have to be able to try to make that case to administrators. I need the time to teach these methods deeply and well and give them a chance to try it and, you know, uh, and improve and, and, and uh, master, back to master, really master this. Uh, and what, what some schools have done is just say, here are the units that are the most important to do this in or the power standards, they won't do it on everything, but they will choose some places to go really, really deep to teach those deeper skills. Uh, and then you have to make the argument to the administration that that is a kind of transferable learning that will matter most. I remember uh, I was an English teacher, so I'm going to make a for example. I love the one that you gave in science. Um, but my own kids, you know, getting them through school, uh, one of my kids had a teacher who decided to, at the beginning of ninth grade, take two months, maybe it was two and a half, to teach uh, Oedipus and to have them write an uh, essay, which had many, many scaffolds and many, many drafts and many, many, you know, self-assessments and peer assessments and teacher assessments and so on, um, to write an essay about whether Oedipus, you know, determined his own fate. Pretty sophisticated question for beginning a ninth grade, which took this time. And that process was so deep. Uh, my own child wrote an essay that was college level work by the time it was done, but he never again needed to learn how to write an essay. So that two months was really well spent instead of skating by and letting the kids do what they knew how to do and writing something kind of, you know, half baked and whatever and moving on to the next thing. That was what enabled him to be successful in college, taking that two months in ninth grade. Same thing with, you know, what you would want to do with, you know, scientific inquiry. So we're going to have to teach our leaders and teach, you know, everyone what deep teaching is about. Uh, we've got old ideas about learning that dominate in the structures of schools. Um, and it's 
it's going to be the job of teachers and teacher educators to say, this is what's necessary for kids to really master, um, you know, a way of thinking, a way of working, uh, a knowledge base that transfers. So I wish you. I think we have Thank time you. for one last question. So I'm going to go to our dean who is uh, present. I'm turning the camera so that it gets to you. Give me a moment, but go ahead. So, so Linda, I've been enjoyed very much uh, reading a lot of your work, and I enjoyed your presentation this morning. You started off by saying that you had been involved in the redesign of the Stanford Teacher Education Program, and you thought it was about time to maybe do that again. Um, so I was going to ask if you could talk a little bit about what you might anticipate a redesign to look like. But before I do that, let me give you a small scenario. The teachers that are, or the students that are coming into our concurrent education program this year graduate in 2024. They'll be teaching in 2055 or 2060. Schools and learning and teaching will change tremendously over that period of time. We'll have the infusion of amazing amounts of new technology. For example, Brookings just had a uh, report this morning about how AI will influence teaching and learning over the next uh, period of time. I was wondering if you might crystal ball a bit about what we as teacher educators and as members of the teaching profession who are informing teacher educators about what we should be doing to think about the way in which teacher education programs should be designed over the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, well, that's an ambitious question, and we have two minutes left. <laughs> um, we have a little more than two minutes on that. Uh, <laughs> Let me just say a word about what we did when I when I first went to Stanford it was 1998, so it was years ago, <clears throat> and the, we did a massive redesign of the program. I'll say a couple of things about what we did then, and then you know where I think um, the next round is. Uh, at that time, you know, people were in um, there were a set of courses that were taught sometimes by really amazing and wonderful professors, but not linked tightly to each other. The curriculum had not been really thought through, so we didn't have a course on how students learn. We had a course on adolescent health, but not one on learning. You know, things that the state had said, you have to teach this, but if the state didn't say teach it, we didn't, we didn't have it. So we had to create a curriculum that was very aligned and integrated, bring the professors together to be sure that their courses were speaking to each other. We extended uh, content pedagogy courses so that it's only a one-year program, unfortunately. It's a post-baccalaureate master's. Um, but there would be three uh, quarters of content pedagogical coursework that were completely uh, aligned and linked to each other. There was a course in learning and development. We brought in a lot more English learners, especially students, into the curriculum, into equity, and how you think about equity in the classroom. So we did a, a redesign that made it much more coherent and aligned and then we completely overhauled clinical work because it was very haphazard people would go out and you know somebody would say can we get a classroom for a student teacher so um, I remember personally going out into uh, about 200 classrooms and then Rachel Lotan came on board as our director and she and I and others went out into many 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 classrooms in many many schools with a um, framework for what we wanted to see happening in classrooms that would make it analogy, make it connected to our curriculum. Um, and then uh, we began to find that there were lots of talented teachers that our placement director didn't know about, lots of interesting schools that we weren't working with. Then we went to those schools that were the most, where there was a lot of energy around both, um, you know, moving towards this kind of teaching, but also uh, a commitment to equity. And we asked them to be partners. Um, we said, we don't want your classrooms, we want your expertise, and we want to be partners in professional development school relationship. And as we worked with those schools where we started to cluster all of our teaching placements, we also brought as many resources to them to bring their uh, teaching into the 21st century and, you know, forward looking as possible. So, for example, we made every course at Stanford freely available to any cooperating teacher in any of these schools, or to any teacher in any of these schools, so we could get more cooperating teachers. 
So we got our president to say they would offer free courses and free opportunities to um, to the people in, in our professional learning development schools. So it's like we would take a... And, you know, you don't always have money in, in universities, but you have credits, you know, you have courses. So you that's, you know, if you can offer what you already have, that's a good way. But we would bring like an entire science department. We have a, Stanford has a, a place where they do a place called Jasper Ridge, which is a biological preserve. And they're uh, developing, you know, all kinds of environmental um, studies and, and so on. And so we would take a whole science department from a high school up there. They would get the probeware and the, the experience of measuring the environment and looking at it and you know, all the stuff we do. You can see I'm over my head. But anyway, they did all that. <laughs> they bring it back. Uh, they bring it back. And then the whole department would be engaged in this kind of inquiry teaching. And then they'd start to take their kids up to the reserve and use the probeware and so on. So we were able to bring the teaching in a number of schools and departments, uh, much more to the cutting edge of practice by virtue of a two-way partnership in which they were taking very seriously the training of our student teachers. Um, and they did some wonderful innovations in school-wide uh, you know, mentoring for, for, incoming, uh, for novice student teachers. Uh, but we were able to help them uh, get a lot of um, ideas and insights and, and um, resources for the, the nature of their teaching. So it could be to uh, resemble what was going on in the university. So my point is that the relationship is key to helping people move forward and it's gotta be as inventive and creative a two-way relationship as possible. Um, and some of the next part of, I think what we need to do at Stanford is really strengthening again, Restrengthening those relationships with our partner schools, uh, and you know, rebooting that opportunity for them to be in the conversation and the learning about 21st century practice. I mean, we're in a place where AI is being invented, so you know, we've got to figure out ways to share that with the folks in in the K-12 schools that we partner with. Um, in terms of you know, uh, what will technology do to schools and so on? Clearly, we need um, our our teachers to be learning uh, ways to use technology. There's a lot of evidence. You know, in the U.S., we've, we've got a lot of people trying to uh, invent ways that you could just stick kids on computers and they wouldn't need very many teachers. It doesn't work. We've got hundreds of studies now showing that for most kids, there are a small number of kids who learn independently via uh, AI and, and um, you know, um, what some people here are calling personalized learning, which doesn't involve people, it just involves computers. <laughs> um, there are, for most kids, that is not as effective. There are uses of technology in collaboration with people, with teachers and peers who are working together on projects and activities that the computer can be used for that are producing stronger learning gains, but just sticking kids on computers and saying, you know, the computer is going to figure out what you need to know and then you're going to march through is actually producing very disappointing uh, results in most of the studies that are going on. So I think what teachers need to learn is how to use technology in ways that have empowerment for students about the use of technology to accomplish goals that they have in collaboration with other human beings rather than just being quote unquote taught by them. Um, and, you know, I think as programs are thinking about how they uh, need to evolve, again, the most important thing you can do probably, I mean, I think courses are important. I think my personal courses were wonderful. Everybody thinks that about their personal courses. Um, but the most important thing that candidates need is to be in classrooms and in schools where cutting edge practices are going on and where they can see it and participate in it and then link that back to a broader base of research and so on. So that's still the fundamental question is how to find the right relationships, uh, I think, in the field that help people be ready and help those 
those places get as much access as possible to 21st century um, knowledge and learning, which the university can help make available. Linda, I think that that is a beautiful and perfect, whoops, there I'm uh, too low, a beautiful and perfect place for us to end. Um, my colleague Jim Strachan at the Ministry of Education often says that all that really matters in the end is relationships, relationships, relationships. <laughs> So you've been unbelievably generous with us with your time. I want to just say that any time I've come to listen to you at AERA or other conferences, I'm always in rooms where there is standing room only. So we've been so lucky to have you with us today. And I just want to thank you once again for taking time out, especially early on a Saturday morning. And I know you've had a very busy week um, to be with us. Thank you so, so much. My pleasure. Great to see you. Thanks. Let me just say thank you for the work that you do. We are all learning this together. So uh, I appreciate uh, the work that you're engaged in and I hope that I'll get a chance to hear more about where it goes. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.